Why do thousands of people choose Bergen for their vacation every year? The historic architecture. The art galleries and museums. There's just so many elbows. I want to see what rain looks like. Bergen soaks through to your core. After a couple of very enjoyable days in Bergen, the time had come to venture further afield. The best way to explore Norway was always going to be by car, but in the EV capital of the world only an Elbil would do. Thankfully Hertz had a good variety of Elbils available to rent. We were given a Kia Soul, it's a Kia Soul. often overlooked and underestimated in comparison to the Nissan Leaf, and a car that is equipped with many impressive electrical gadgets and creature comforts. They've even got a Cloudberry gem holder. <laughs> yes, I found some to take home, guys. Feckin' Yaldi. Anyway, we named our soul Bjorn, after Norway's most well-known EV blogger and YouTuber. Having downloaded and registered the apps for Norway's three biggest electric vehicle charging network operators, BKK, Grown Contact, and Fortum Charge and Drive, we were ready to set off on our first day's adventure to Flam, a small village on the edge of Arlandsfjorden, some 170 kilometers away taking in a few sites and strategic charging stops along the way. Our first stop of the day was at Dalle, only 63 kilometres from Bergen and therefore well within Bjorn's projected 190 kilometre range, this stop was purely to test the reliability of BKK's app on foreign phones whilst we still had plenty of battery capacity left, rather than risking running into problems when we were running low on charge. So this is Bjorn charging up on our first ever attempt on a Norwegian charge point. So this is part of the BKK network and uh, someone's added some interesting artwork there. But there's an ADD unit which, this is a rarity for anyone from the UK, actually works and is working very well. So this is activated using an app. It's 2.5 kroner per minute, 25 pence a minute roughly. So uh, it basically incentivizes you to take what you need and then immediately get on your way. But look at this for a charge stop. Look at that scenery. Just surrounded by mountains, you've got a nice stream, you can't really see it there, but uh, there's a lovely little stream over there as well. And it's right next to a shell garage so you can pop in and uh, grab some lunch and so on as well. Really quite a good setup this, but this is quite unusual for a BKK charge point because there's only one. You'll see at the next stop that we go to, they tend to build them in huge numbers. That scenery would quickly end up looking tame in comparison to what we saw later on. For the next leg of our journey, we ventured 40 kilometres along the road to Vossevangen, taking in many scenic river, lake and waterfall views as we went. We visited Norway in September, the country's wettest month of the year, but thankfully the rain tapered off as we drove east and we were able to enjoy some sunshine. Vossevangen is a hub for all manners of outdoor sports and reminded me somewhat of Aviemore back in Scotland. The village may only have a population of 6,000 people, but they cater for Elbils in a manner that would make towns around the world that are 10 or even 100 times their size rather jealous. She's living in a pram. <laughs> Look at The village's charging hub has eight rapid chargers and the groundworks opposite them would suggest that there are plans to install even more. The site is conveniently located near the village's shops and boasts a scenic backdrop courtesy of Lake Vangsvatne. For all of Vossavangen's Elbil credentials, when we went to explore the town, EVs were few and far between, although we did see a couple of electric vehicles. Following our brief pit stop in Vossavangen, we headed back out onto the E16. The scenery became increasingly dramatic as we headed northeast, giving us a taste of what to expect when we reached our next stop and our first challenge, Stalheim Slaver.
This unforgiving, torturous brute of a road is one of the steepest in Europe. With 13 hairpins and a gradient of 20%, this road was the main artery for all road traffic between Bergen and Oslo until 1980. Bjorn previously attempted to descend this road in a Tesla Model X using regenerative braking alone. Oh shit! This is freaking scary, man. Now the time had come to replicate this challenge in the Kia Soul that bears his name and the road's closed. Yeah, not much I can do about that. Maybe it's the time of year. Whilst the road closure was undeniably disappointing, it was absolutely worth the trip to check out the sights and sounds of this dramatic landscape. Hillbill. Still determined to have a go at the regen challenge, I decided to try it on the much less imposing hill going back down the way we came. It really wasn't that steep, but despite that, I still messed it up. Regen only. Next up was a quick charge stop at Gudvangen, which is part of a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This was the first Fortum charge and drive rapid that we'd used, and true to Norwegian form, it was ideally located right next to the E16, at a well-equipped shell garage next to a replica Viking village on the edge of a fjord. All of which made for a pleasant charging experience, surrounded by friendly woodland creatures. Once again, the scenery was stunning in every direction, and courtesy of having avoided the tourist season, we had this beautiful place almost entirely to ourselves. We spent a good half an hour wandering around the shoreline taking photos, and saw evidence of much larger electric vehicles operating in the area. Whilst the car was recharging, I took the opportunity to try a local snack, which has apparently become something of a national institution. So in Norway, there is a chocolate bar that is to Kit Kat, what Iron Brew is to Coca-Cola, uh, which is basically a, a massive middle finger to the big establishment, and it is the Kvik Lunch, which looks very much like a Kit Kat actually, but uh, apparently tastes considerably better. So let's find out. Mm. It's very similar, but that definitely gets my vote. So, um, yeah, that ought to annoy Nestle a bit. Our charge at Gudvangen gave us more than enough range to complete our exploring of the villages surrounding Urlandsfjorden, starting with Flom. Flom is a village of about 350 residents and seemingly 350,000 tourists, and when you see the scenery firsthand, it's not hard to see why. The village's world famous railway line is Norway's third most popular tourist attraction, tackling an 863 metre elevation through rugged, natural landscapes to Myrdal, a mere 20 kilometres away. The railway line is electrified, but that's not the only electric form of transport to be found in the village. Twizzy. Twizzy. Twizzy, 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 Twizzy. Flum has a fleet of Renault Twizzies available to hire, so tourists can easily explore the surrounding area at their own leisure. Whilst we were in Flum, by sheer luck, we were joined by arguably Norway's most impressive electric vehicle, the Future of the Fjords. This magnificent all-electric ferry was introduced in April 2018, and carries up to 400 passengers between Flam and Gudvangen. The Future of the Fjords' unique design allows passengers to walk over about 80% of its exterior. 20-minute rapid charging sessions are performed whilst the vessel is docked at the piers in Flam and Gudvangen, to provide up to 800 kilowatt hours of energy to a pair of 450 kilowatt motors. Sadly, we didn't have time to board the Flom Railway or Future of the Fjords, but as we headed to our next destination at Stegastein viewpoint, fittingly, what should join us on our journey but the Future of the Fjords? There's your money shot right there. Anyway, it turned out the road to Stegastein was closed, so we doubled back and went to Undredal. On our way, we stumbled upon a radio station that only plays music in Norwegian, called Norsk Pop. 
By chance, the track that played as we descended the hill towards Underedal perfectly captured the folky beauty of this sleepy rural village. Norse pop was great fun, actually. Ever heard Paul and Linda McCartney's Heart of the Country sung in Norwegian? You have now. As the sun started to set on day one of our Elbil adventure, we headed back the way we came, with a quick top up at Vossavangen ensuring that we made it back to Bergen with plenty of charge to spare. Unsurprisingly, Norway gave us many beautiful views on the way back to our hotel. Conveniently, our hotel was located next to a multi-storey car park with a plethora of Elbil charge points. The car park had a charging tariff, but also discounted parking fees for Elbils. We left Bjorn to get a full charge overnight, ahead of a road trip out into the sticks the next day. On day two, we set off the beaten track somewhat and headed towards allegedly one of the most beautiful roads in the world. To get there, we left the main E16 artery between Bergen and Oslo and headed 78 kilometres along the FV7 towards our first charge stop at Norheimsund. The rain had returned, but all that served to do was craft amazing mythical landscapes with low-lying clouds and increasingly impressive waterfalls, such as the one with its own dedicated viewpoint just before the aptly named Fossenbrata, or Waterfall, Tunnel. Norheimsund has a mini BKK hub with three rapid chargers. After loading up the app and pressing start on the charger, we topped up the battery and made our way to Turvigbygd to catch the ferry to Jondal. So we're on the ferry to Yondel now, it only takes about 20 minutes and we've been given an L-Bill discount. It's one of the many incentives that Norway has for electric vehicles. Um, we've also managed to sail through some toll roads without paying any tolls as well, so that's quite nice. Something else interesting I've just noticed, um, well, I've been aware since the start that every electric vehicle in Norway has a registration plate that begins with E, which makes them easily denotable. But there's a plug-in hybrid over there. It's a BMW of some description, one of the fatter ones. It's not quite an SUV, but it's definitely not a standard 3 Series. And it has the telltale uh, you know, plug flap at the front of the car. So it's definitely a PHEV, but it doesn't have an E at the start of the plate. So clearly Norway has decided that uh, PHEVs are not as worthy as pure electrics and um, I've got to say I, I do quite like that. Uh, the incentives are such for pure EVs that they massively outnumber anything with an internal combustion engine and electric motor in it and that includes standard hybrid and plug-in hybrid as well. So uh, yeah, their incentives have worked incredibly well. And so began our drive on one of the most scenic roads in the world. Or so we thought. Barely a few minutes into our journey, we encountered an unscheduled stop. Come see the scenic views of Norway. This is one of the traditional practices of asphalting in the middle of nowhere and blocking off the entire road for 20 minutes, which is, you know what, fair enough, because all the roads that we've seen here, all the roads that we've driven, have been immaculate, and you cannot say the same about roads in most of the UK, in fact in, in many other countries as well, so uh, good on them. Uh, they've obviously invested a heck of a lot of money in their infrastructure. So whilst we're not going anywhere in a hurry, uh, still waiting on the asphalting being completed, 
might as well take the opportunity to talk a little bit about Bjorn the Kia Soul because uh, we've been driving it but not mentioning too much about it. So how does it compare to the Leaf? Very favourably. I mean, I'd said on paper it certainly does and uh, in practice it has been a really solid car actually. Uh, plenty of creature comforts including rather clever heated seats, left and right, driver and passenger, independently controlled. In fact, you can independently control the climate as a whole on each half of the car. So if you're single occupancy or if someone prefers to be boiling hot, then, uh, you know, you can obviously change the, the temperature and the, the heat settings and so on on each half of the cabin, which is quite impressive. Uh, in terms of range, this was fully charged overnight in one of the multi-storey car parks, which took about four hours on a, a Type 2 cable. That was showing 201 kilometres when fully charged this morning. So that puts it on a par with, say, a 30 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf off the top of my head. In fact, if not slightly better range. So it's, it's, it's given us a lot of confidence in terms of getting between charge points. Certainly if it was a 24 kilowatt hour Leaf that we've been given, then we would have been able to do this journey, but it would have been a bit tighter. And another advantage of this over the Leaf, certainly over Busby, my own 24 kilowatt hour Leaf, is that this thing will rapid charge incredibly quickly. So I think someone mentioned that actually the Soul is able to rapid charge quicker than most rapid chargers in the UK will allow it to. I think it can charge at about 70 kilowatts, whereas most rapid chargers will top out about 50. And you know what, that's actually been reflected in the charging times that we've seen whenever we've been using the BKK network and so on in Norway. It's been quite an impressive machine uh, and yeah, more than capable of handling these twisty turny country roads. My favourite feature is definitely the uh, adjustable speed limit uh, let alone cruise control, which uh, means that you never ever end up with an accidental speeding ticket. And what, mate? You got nothing on me in it. So that's that's quite a nifty thing. If it actually just be standard on all cars, when you start the car, eco mode is on as standard. But if you want a bit more punch in the acceleration and so on, you can turn eco off. Wahahaha! <laughs> but uh, you know what? I've generally left it on, and. Yeah, on some of the steeper hills, when it's in eco mode, it obviously will feel that wee bit heavier because it's restricting its power. Now, there's your power gauge on the left, but it's still a very torquey car. It will make it up any ridiculously steep gradient with no problems at all, as Norway has already proven. And uh, yeah, another feature it has, which is quite similar to the Leaf actually, is B mode, so extra regen. That's definitely helped to uh, regain some range going down the hills and so on and uh, also as well when you set the speed limit and my favorite feature once again I'll, I'll stop banging on about it but when you set that feature if you're going down a steep hill you will see that the vehicle is regening to uh, you know to keep a constant speed rather than using mechanical brakes so actually that helps even more another handy feature that the soul has is twin Cigarette lighter outlets, well, nobody really uses them for cigarettes anymore, but plenty of uh, electrical gizmos could be plugged in there, plus a USB and an auxiliary input or output as well. That's plenty for, for entertainment. It's been keeping three phones charged uh, throughout the entire journey. There's also plenty of storage space, a couple of cup holders there, and this massive ducat for snacks. After only 15 minutes or so, we were once again on our way, now one of the first lucky motorists to test out this freshly asphalted road. Despite being aware of this route's scenic credentials, nothing prepared me for just how incredible the landscape was at our first stop at Hirayana Rasteplatz. Look at that for review right across the fjord. And as well as that, there's this unexpectedly rocky landscape here. That kind of reminds me of the west coast of Ireland. I was in Doolin for a friend's wedding earlier this year and we took a drive along the west coast and they were just it was such a rocky landscape. But here, there's this bizarre situation where you've got 
trees that have managed to grow out from in between the rocks. There must be so little soil there, and yet they've managed to get a footing. That's absolutely incredible. Doesn't matter which way you look. Norway is spherically beautiful. Norway, you've got a face that just won't quit. The amazing thing about this place, the amazing thing about this place, is the sheer tranquility. We are the only... No, get away, this is my place! We are literally This truly was the most perfect place I've ever been. As we ventured north in this utopia, we encountered plenty more quaint and idyllic scenes, yet rarely saw another person. We took the opportunity to stop in Heran, the first sizeable village on the route. Again, it was a scene of pure perfection, but with not a single other person to be seen. We thoroughly enjoyed our wander around Heran before climbing the hill north towards Utne. As we headed north, there were several orchards along the route, each of which had an unmanned farm shop next to the road. The one that we stopped at had the best apple juice I've ever drank in my life, and apples that were actually red on the inside. As we continued our journey, I made a couple of observations, most notably, oh my god, there's another person. He's like, oh my god, it's a car. Hmm. Probably like, oh my god, it's an L-bill, because one thing that we have not seen since getting off the ferry at Yondo, is another rail bill. Mm. Which actually it confuses me for a couple of reasons. One, we are managing perfectly fine in this L bill. Mm. So why the heck when there's so many incentives for L bills in Norway is no one else out in the sticks doing it? Two, they've all got driveways, they can charge them at home. So you know, for local journeys and stuff, it's fine, and obviously there's plenty of rapid chargers in any direction they go. Three tight, twisty, turny roads in a manual, quite a horrible, laborious, crunchy thing to do. This is taking it in its stride with one gear and regenerative braking and loads of torque. By now it wasn't too far to Utne. We briefly stopped off at Venus to admire the landscapes that are out of pure fantasy with multiple waterfalls that cascade from cloud-curtained heavens. It was here that I also noticed one of the Kia Soul's slightly more annoying aspects. Your door's open. <laughs> Your door's open. Your door's open, I'm fully aware. From here, we were only seven kilometres away from Utne, where we would catch the ferry across the Hardangerfjord towards our next charging stop at Chinsarvik. The following scenery porn is rated 18. charge and drive uh, charge point. These two are tritium charge points, familiar to people in the UK. 
because they're used by Instable. Ooh, so shiny. So we've got some big, meaty DC rapid chargers here. If you're an energy story driver, it sucks to be you. Anyway, what we do in Norway is we do things by app. So I've got the force and charge and drive up. Um, I've already added my profile, my card details and so on. And then you find the charge point that you're after on the app. Well, apparently this Type 2 is kicking about. They must be over there. Oh, they're actually right next door. There we go. That's quite handy. Anyway, so we'll choose that. And uh, then we look for the ID, like so. So that means 1366A. Choose it like that. And there we go. 25 pence a minute, effectively. Start charging. You might need to press the start button on this. It should start glowing in a minute, hopefully. There we go. And you can you can actually switch between fully charging it and only going to 80%. Now that's quite handy because most of the time you only ever need to go to 80% when rapid charging. We are going to be doing a fair bit of driving, so I'm going to take it a bit beyond 80. The next leg of our journey took us around the other side of Hardangerfjord to our next and final charge stop back at the BKK hub in Norheimsund, 75 kilometres away. On our way, we encountered some mighty civil engineering feats which were almost as mythical as the surrounding landscapes. Arguably the most impressive was Hardanger Brua, or Hardanger Bridge, which shoots straight out of a tunnel in the side of the fjord, carrying traffic 55 metres above the fjord for 1.4 kilometres and straight into a tunnel on the other side, where you are greeted by a roundabout in a tunnel. We also encountered this civil engineering. Hey kids, wasn't it fun when we held up when we were waiting on asphalt and getting done? Wanna do it again? Well, the day's your lucky day. Yay, there we go. Yeah, so we are at Norheimsen, or actually heading to Norheimsen, I should say, uh, via the north side of the fjord. And yeah, we're, we're gonna be here for about 20 minutes. However, um, look at the view again. Not a bad place to stop. You can just about see through the uh, the raindrops there. We are just surrounded by clouds and mist and magical landscape and pretty houses and yeah. On our way once again, civil engineering gave way to incredible landscapes with multitudes of waterfalls descending from the sheer mountain edges of the fjord. Some of them got a little too close to the road. <laughs> After crossing Fixe Bridge, about 15 kilometres north of Norheimsund, the road started to undulate much more, so I had another go at a regen braking challenge. All regen, folks. Uh, no, <laughs> After charging at Norheimsund, we had an impromptu stop at Steinstalfossen, a massive waterfall en route back to Bergen. A path leads you behind the waterfall to a viewpoint on the other side. It is a surprisingly young waterfall, formed in 1699, with a main drop of 20 metres. When you see a waterfall up close like this, you start to appreciate why Norway harnesses this abundant resource to produce almost all of its electricity. Perfect for powering hillbills. Now back at Bergen, it was reluctantly time to say goodbye to Bjorn. Bye bye, Kiasso. Bye, Bjorn. And tally up our total costs for two days' worth of motoring. We'd spent the equivalent of £26.51 on rapid chargers, plus £28.13 on overnight parking for two nights, which included two full charges. Bjorn was exempt from road toll fees, saving us a whopping £43.25 and had discounted ferry fees of £18.49. With petrol in Norway costing around £1.50 per litre, a 50 miles per gallon petrol car would have cost £50.25 in fuel alone. Parking would have worked out similar at about £27.36, but wouldn't have included two full charges like with an L bill. The petrol car would have incurred the aforementioned road toll fees and ferry fees of £35.93. 
Bjorn saved us a grand total of £83.66, a saving of 53%. But it is clear that even without free toll road access and discounted ferry fees, driving an ill-bill in Norway saves a fortune versus driving an internal combustion engine. On our way back to Oslo from Bergen, we let the train take the strain, and I was finally able to sit back, relax, and fully appreciate the dramatic and ever-changing landscapes of the Elbil capital of the world. What?